Hello and welcome to I'd Like to Know. This is our question and answer program, our Bible question and answer program. This is a program where we like to go into the Word of God, answer your questions, find answers if answers can indeed be found. Sometimes we find an answer and then we find more information after the program is over, but that's always fun also. My name is C.A. Murray. I'm in the company of our speaker director, Pastor Stephen Bohr, and uh, we are happy to be here, and uh, I know he's happy to be here. Always. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good time on this program, as you can no doubt see. My sister said to me the other day, she said, you know, I, I, I watch your program. It looks like you and, and the pastor actually like each other, and I will, <laughs> I will tell you a secret. It's true. We do like each other. We like each other a lot. We get along together well. And yeah. any time you, you draw close to Christ, you draw closer to your brothers and sisters. That's right. And, and we see so much of the Word of God alike. We are alike in many ways, uh, far too many to, to let you in on, but we are. <laughs> and um, uh, we have a good time together. The working relationship here at Secrets Unsealed is a beautiful one. Everybody gets along. And um, this is the kind of place when somebody makes a mistake, they are quick to say, I'm sorry, and press on together. And that's a good place. It's a good working atmosphere. So uh, yeah. giving you all that behind the scenes stuff, we want to answer your questions. We invite you to become part of the program. I've got a little pile here. He has a much larger one on his desk from which we try to mine questions each and every week. But if you'd like to send in a question, you can email us at TV at sometv.org. That's tv at sometv.org. And we will do our very best to answer your questions. Pastor, before we get started, would you please lead us in prayer? Yes, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne in the powerful name of Jesus. There are so many questions that we have, many of which will be answered only in eternity mm. by Jesus. But in this program, we ask that you will be with us, enlighten us, as we try to answer these questions that have been sent in. We ask for the guidance of your spirit, for your heavenly wisdom. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. When last we were together, Pastor, we touched on a question. I don't know if we dealt with it thoroughly. Uh, someone asked a question about dancing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Perhaps we ought to tidy that up a little bit before we go into our new material. But um, do you have anything else to add to, to what we touched on just, I think it was last week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the stories that the Bible has that people use to defend dancing is they say, well, David danced. <laughs> and uh, it's true that the word dance is used for David, but there's several things that we need to take into account. First of all, God did not command him to dance. It was kind of like a momentary reaction on his part mm -hmm. because the Ark of the Covenant was coming back to Jerusalem. And uh, so it was a specific historical occasion mm -hmm. that led him, probably we should say, to jump for joy. <laughs> it, and, uh, and from what we understand, it was closer to jumping for joy than the kind of stuff we see today. Yes. Yeah. And it was solo. Yes. In other words, there's no... There's no way that you can defend Good point. romantic dancing, yes. you know, uh, chest to chest uh, <laughs> with this story mm -hmm. because he's dancing by himself or he's jumping for joy by himself mm -hmm. in a specific historical event, the coming of uh, the um, Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, yes, yes. and also the fact that he was not commanded to do it. It's mm -hmm. a spontaneous thing that he did. The Bible mentions many things that people did uh, where there's no moral evaluation on what they did, whether mm. it's right or wrong. Good point. So we need, we can't just take a story from the Bible and say, well, because David did it, uh, we're justified in doing it yeah. uh, romantically, if you please. Mm -hmm. The Bible touches on God's interface with man, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Everything the Bible talks about is not sanctioned by God. Some mm -hmm. things, we may get to some a little bit later, are specifically not sanctioned by God, mm -hmm. but it mentions it all. And of course, these, th these things were given as examples for us. So it was a, a spontaneous reaction. Do you remember 20 years earlier when the ark was taken, Eli died, Hophni died, Phineas died, uh, wife died in childbirth, you know, <coughs> Ichabod was born, what well, they called the child yeah. Ichabod. So, you know, it was a sad day, and now it's back. So that's a great day. So in, in response to 
a once in a lifetime occasion. Yeah. <laughs> he leaves for joy. You can't make a gospel doctrine out of that. That's right. Yeah. And, um, you know, furthermore, David's dance in the streets of Jerusalem was what awakened the jealousy in the heart of Saul. Yes. Because the women started saying, you know, Saul has killed his thousands and mm. David has killed his ten thousands. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the end result of his jumping for joy or for whatever it was mm -hmm. uh, led to uh, Saul developing jealousy. Not, not to uh, justify right. Saul for that, right. but uh, it's interesting to see that what the consequence was. Yeah, and another person who wasn't so happy at what he did was his wife, Michael. Uh, Saul's yeah. daughter. She was yeah. not pleased at all. Uh, so we're talking about a one-time thing. And again, one of the things we mentioned last time when we mentioned this is that if you're going to get to the point where you're a professional dancer uh, and dancing in competitions and those kind of things, and I think that was the, 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 the thought that was underlying the question, you got to put in a lot of time. Oh, yeah. You know, you can't, you can't just, right. you got to put in time. And that is time that can be better used, I suspect, doing the work of the Lord or uh, studying to show thyself approved or mm -hmm witnessing to your neighbor. There's so many other things you can do for the cause of Christ in the time, the considerable amount of time that you would use uh, to bone up on dancing. You can use that time perhaps better doing something for the yep. cause of Christ. Not only time, but money. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have another question. Uh, this one, uh, somebody first of all comments that, uh, um, let's see, this person is a new Adventist and they're thankful for our programs here at Secret Sun Seal. And then comes the question. My pastor was preaching in my church and he said when Jesus was born to this earth, he was blank about his godly nature. In other words, he didn't know about his pre-existence. Pre he said he was fully human, which I agree, mm -hmm. but also he said he didn't know about this pre-existence in heaven when he was on earth and he learned everything from his mother. How truthful is that? In other words, when did Jesus become aware that he was not a mere human being and he had the divine mission mm -hmm. uh, to save the human race? Mm -hmm. Was it at birth? Was it, you know, later on? Was it when he went to the cross? Um, we split the difference. One of the things we see in the Desire of Ages, Ellen White talks about his first trip to the temple mm -hmm. as a young man in that 12th year. Uh, as he went into the temple, he looked at the white robe priest, she says. He looked at the sacrifices. He looked at the, the prayers being offered. He looked at all of the things that were going on, and he had this awakening that he was somehow involved and tied up in all of this. Mm -hmm. And as he looked and uh, understood, uh, he lingered. In fact, he spent a, a couple of days there before his parents found that he, they had left him behind. But that seemed to be the time when it fully dawned on him that he was tied up in that mission, that the sacrifices of the, of the temple were going to be sacrifices that, that uh, he was going to make, that his life was tied up with that. So that's the first time we get a true understanding that he understood specifically what his mission was and that he was central to all that was going on in the temple. Mm -hmm. In Desire of Ages, we have this uh, very interesting statement. This is uh, page 78, mm -hmm. uh, the first visit of Jesus to the temple. Uh, his bar mitzvah, yes. if you please. Yes. Because uh, <laughs> every male, 12 years and older, had to come to Jerusalem yes. for a certain feast, and mm -hmm. Passover was one of them. Yes. For the first time, the child Jesus looked upon the temple. Mm -hmm. He saw the white robed priests there you go. performing their performing, performing. their solemn ministry. Mm -hmm. He beheld the bleeding victim upon the altar of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. With the worshipers, he bowed in prayer while the cloud of incense ascended before God. He witnessed the impressive rites of the Paschal service. Day by day, because this is several days that he spent there, mm -hmm. day by day he saw their meaning more clearly. Every act seemed to be bound up with his own life. Yes. New impulses were awakening within him, mm -hmm. silent and absorbed. He seemed to be studying out a great problem. Yes. The mystery of his mission was opening to the Savior. Yeah. I am sure that Mary, as a diligent mother, as most all Jewish mothers did, taught 
her son about the coming Messiah, taught mm -hmm. her son about the, the desire of ages. But he didn't enter into that fully until that day when he saw mm -hmm. what was going on and realized that that was him. That was part of his life, mm -hmm. part of his, his existence. And, and I don't think that his mother fully realized what kind of Messiah he was. I agree. I you agree. know, it, it, it kind of dawned on her as time went by. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's an episode in the Gospel of Mark that indicates that she did not fully understand what the mission of Jesus was. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in Mark chapter 3, beginning with verse 33. Uh, it says here, actually a little bit earlier than that, um, verse 31 to verse 35. Um, it says, And his mother and his brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent word to him and called him. And of course, uh, Jesus had been working so hard for so long mm -hmm. that they thought that he was maybe losing it a little bit. And so they come <laughs> to take him home. Yes. And it says in verse 32, And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about on those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, yes. my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother mm -hmm. and sister and mother. And you know, we know that at the temple, Jesus knew that Joseph was not his real father because he said, I am about my father's business. Yes. He was talking about his heavenly, his father. heavenly father. So he realized that his pater paternity mm -hmm. was actually from heaven. Yeah, he, he knew a lot of things because uh, the people questioning him asked, how, how does this guy know all of this stuff having never been taught? Well, we never taught him what they're saying, mm -hmm. but he, he had learned it uh, at, at his mother's knee. And of course, over the last several days of this experience, he was picking up new clues and, and, and understanding the context for mm -hmm. all of this stuff. They hadn't taught him, but he knew. He yeah. knew who he was and he knew who he was about at that time. What's interesting, you know, Pastor, you look at a, a person who went through so much of his life having no one to really enter into the secret understanding of what he was here for. John the Baptist, Ellen White tells us, as, as great a prophet as he was, he didn't understand yep. Christ's mission. You know, he didn't understand. The disciples didn't understand till very, very, very late. Mm -hmm. um, really, if you look at it, till after he had, he had passed, uh, uh, passed on to heaven, uh, there were very, very few who had an intimate understanding of what Jesus was about. It must be really tough to go through life and have nobody to be able to truly understand your mission yeah. and what you're about. So if you're misunderstood, you're in good company. You're in good company, <laughs> indeed. I noticed that you had, I kind of peeked at your notes, uh, you had some verses written down about the encounter of Jesus with the, uh, with the priests and the intelligentsia. Uh, uh, actually, no, these, these, these are, are notes for another question uh, that, are, that, that uh, hopefully we, we will get to. Um, let me see. I think it's in Luke chapter 2, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, where it speaks about his visit to Jerusalem. Uh -huh. uh, this is found in Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. Uh, but, but it's interesting here uh, to read the description of his encounter with uh, the teachers, yes. with the rabbis. Yes. Uh, it says in Luke chapter 2 and verse uh, 45, when the parents come back looking for Jesus, mm -hmm. and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. And when it came about that after three days, they found him in the temple, yes. sitting in the midst of the teachers, mm -hmm. uh, the, rabbi, rabbi, the rabbinos, <laughs> both, listen carefully, both listening to them yes. and asking them questions. Asking them questions. And then verse 47 says, and all who heard him, this 12-year-old kid, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Mm -hmm. So they were asking Jesus questions, and Jesus was shooting back the answers, yes. and they were amazed. Yeah, and then asking that, them questions that they were struggling yeah, with. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that someone uh, his age, who had never studied in the schools of the rabbis, Precisely. knew how uh, as much as he did. Mm -hmm. to, ask, to ask a good question, you've got to have information. Uh -huh. So he's posing questions that's testing their knowledge, answering their questions, so, yeah, their mouths were, were open because <laughs> they, where does this kid get this stuff from? Yeah. He's only 12 years old, and yeah, we yeah. never taught him. Ellen White mentions that um, one thing that he 
talked to the religious leaders about was Isaiah 53. Mm. Basically, the idea was, you believe that the Messiah is going to come, he's going to sit on the throne of David, and he's going to rule with a rod of iron, but what do we do with Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, the where suffering it says servant. that yeah. he's killed? Yeah. And of course, from there, hmm, interesting yeah. <laughs> that a young child would ask this kind of a question. <laughs> By the way, this also shows that Mary instructed Jesus fully with the scriptures. Yes, yes. Because he was able to argue from the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So on her knee, Ellen White says, yes. that she taught Jesus to respect and to understand the Old Testament mm -hmm. scriptures. We praise the Lord for that. Amen and amen. Okay, now here we have another one, uh, and uh, this one deals with Matthew 24, 15, so maybe we can go there to Matthew 24 and verse 15. Of course, this is a chapter that speaks about the signs of the soon coming of Christ, and in chapter 24 and verse 15, um, do you have that there? Pastor, I'm going to admit something to you. Um, I'm a slave of technology sometimes. My iPad, which has several Bibles on it, has just died. Oh. It, it has, I'm pressing the button and it's telling me, nope, I'm not coming back, I'm dead. So you're a slave to technology, but technology is not a slave to you. Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> it has a mind of its own. And, and I always come with my Bible, but uh, I said, oh, I got my iPad today, I'll be okay. That's but all I'm right, okay. that's all right. Um, you got to go by what's in the book. Amen. <laughs> One way or the other. Uh, okay, this is the Matthew 24, verse 15. The question is about the abomination of desolation. desolation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, and then in parentheses, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So the question is, uh, in Matthew 24, verse 15, what is the abomination that causes desolation and where is the holy place? Mm -hmm. Well, let's compare the parallel passage in Luke 21. In Luke chapter 21, and it appears to be totally different. I mean, like, no relationship with what we just read in Matthew. Mm -hmm. Because in Matthew it says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, but in Luke 21 and verse 20, it says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. Uh -huh. And then the next verse says, then those who own Judea flee. So the abomination of desolation is related to the Roman armies surrounded Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, now the question is, what did the armies have that was an abomination. Well, in the book Great Controversy, page 26, uh, Ellen White wrote uh, the following uh, words, which, by the way, not only define the abomination of desolation as it applies to literal Jerusalem, mm -hmm. but it also answers the question as to where the holy as place is. Where the was. holy place is, yes. Um, yes. It says, do you have it there by any chance? I do not. The quotation? Okay. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans, now let's stop there for a minute. We know from Josephus that when the Romans surrounded a city uh, and besieged it, mm -hmm. that they would take their standards and they would nail the standards in the ground and then they would kneel and they would render worship to their standards. Mm -hmm. Now, their standards contained an eagle with outstretched wings and a sunburst around the eagle yes. or a golden uh, wreath around the eagle, mm -hmm. which represented the orb of the sun. Yes. In other words, they were worshiping the sun god Mithra, mm -hmm. which had been adopted by the Roman legions in the year 63 BC. But after they came back from Pompeii. the east. Uh -huh. and, and so what they would do is they would surround a city and then they would nail their uh, standards in the ground and they would kneel and render worship to the mm -hmm. sun god. Mm -hmm. That's why Ellen White states, when the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy place, now here's the holy place, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls. So there was an area outside the city walls mm -hmm. that was considered holy, holy not, yes. only the New not only Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And so it says, when the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning sign should be seen, 
those who would escape must make no delay. But of course, here's the question that I want to throw out. How could they escape the city if the city was surrounded and besieged? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe there was a time when it wasn't surrounded or besieged. Maybe there was a little interim in there yes, when uh, the Romans weren't there yeah. and the call was given uh, to go at that, at that time. And that, yeah. it's interesting to see the way in <laughs> which that interim took place. Yes. Um, the, in the year 66, Cestius Gallus, mm -hmm. who was the general of the armies at that time, besieged Jerusalem. And when it looked like the city was going to fall for sure, suddenly something miraculous happened. We know the reason why. But the Roman legions, under the leadership of Cestius, picked up camp and fled. And left, yeah. And the Jews who were inside the city, particularly the false prophets, who were saying, this is God's city, it's going to abide forever, mm -hmm. it's never going to fall, uh, they saw the Roman legions flee. They yeah. said, God is with us, we told you. And so many of the Jews inside the city went after the Roman legions, and the Roman legions suffered many, many losses. Yes. And many of their soldiers were killed. Uh, and so when the Christians in the city saw the Romans put their uh, standards in the ground mm -hmm. and render them worship, they knew they couldn't flee at that moment. Precisely. But when they saw Cestius and the Roman legions leave, they said, that was the sign. This is our shot. And We're Ellen White states in great mm -hmm. controversy that not one Christian perished yes. in the destruction of Jerusalem I remember because the they had seen the sign. Yeah. Now, when they came back under, was it Titus? Titus. Under Titus. Uh, and of course, Titus later became a member. When they, they came back, they finished the work. I mean, they came back for business. Yep. And they destroyed everything. And then four years later at Masada, uh, Flavius Silva uh, took care of the last remnants. So those who listened to Christ, who listened mm -hmm. to the word, were saved. Those who did not and listened to the false prophets were lost. And that scenario is going to be repeated yes. right up until the river uh, Euphrates dries up here at the end of time. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be those who will be listening to the word, who will be led by the word, others listening to false prophets who will be lost. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly enough, Ellen White makes an end time application because Matthew 24 has a twofold application. Oh, yes. It applies in a limited way to the events that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. but it also has an end time global fulfillment. Yes. And she has a couple of statements where she compares the Roman legions worshiping their sun standards mm -hmm. and worship on the day of the sun yeah. at the end of time, mm -hmm. which is the sign for God's, the last opportunity for God's people to leave the large cities, the large cities preparatory yes. to leave the, leave the smaller ones mm -hmm. and then flee. Yeah. Uh, so it, it has two applications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very any, good. Any other uh, things that we need to say about that? I think we've, we've put a bow on that pretty well. Um, uh, as far as the abomination that causes desolation. Okay, now we have one more. We only have like four, a little more than four minutes left. Uh, Ellen White has made several pointed statements on how God uh, is, was and is against polygamy, stating that it was one of the chief reasons for the flood. Why then would God so silently, why was God so silently indifferent to people he chose to work with practicing this sin? mentions Abraham, Jacob, Samuel's father, David, who were polygamous, instead of first asking them to repent of it and put it away, especially when it was done after God had elected them, and he strictly did for other sins. God even actually looked it over in his law, even quasi-regulating it rather than, the ban than ban it outright. So the first thing that I want to say uh, is that... Uh, Ellen White states that the biggest reason for the flood mm -hmm. was the amalgamation of the sons of God with the daughters of men. Mm -hmm. It was not primarily polygamy. It was really uh, the uh, intermingling of the sons of God, which represents the righteous and the daughters of men, three of which were in the genealogy of Cain, that actually uh, brought corruption to the world and brought about the flood. Yes. It was not, polygamy was not the 
major sin that led to the flood. Well said. But what else can we say about polygamy? Well, I've got a quote from Patriots and Prophets, page 338. Polygamy was practiced at an early date, so man had been doing it a long time. It was one of the sins that brought the wrath of God upon the antediluvian world. So God was not ignorant of it. Mm -hmm. and it was one of the did sins. Not, one of the sins, right. Yeah. It, uh, uh, yet after the flood, it again became widespread. It was Satan's studied effort to pervert the marriage institution, to weaken its obligations and lessen its sacredness. For in no sure way could he deface the image of God in man and open the door to misery and vice. Mm -hmm. So it was one of the sins. It was, it was one of the things that, that was responsible for God's reaction against, uh, against humanity. That and, as you well stated, the, the amalgamation. Uh, point being that, you know, the Bible says when God does not swiftly react to things, when he does not swiftly punish sin, man is emboldened in his sin. Mm -hmm. So you take a little step, the sky doesn't fall, you take another big step, Pretty soon you're running down that lane because you don't think mm -hmm. uh, uh, judgment will ever come, uh, but it does come. And more than that, the the condition of the world under uh, these kinds of things deteriorated and deteriorated and deteriorated, and man began to s destroy his own world and his relationship with the Lord because mm -hmm. of this practice and other practices yeah. at that time. And the bottom line is that in culture at that time, this practice of polygamy was entrenched in society. Mm -hmm. And you know, God sometimes allows time to pass, like with slavery, for example. Mm -hmm. You look at the New Testament, the New Testament doesn't denounce slavery, mm. but it gives principles to that eventually would lead to the abolition mm -hmm. of slavery. Yes. Uh, so God knows that sometimes it's not best to confront something head on, mm -hmm. unless it's a matter of, of definite principle, uh, because he knows that eventually in the course of time, uh, people will be enlightened and they'll understand yes. uh, that, that God's way is the best way. And sometimes people don't understand why are we suffering? Why are we going through all of this? It's because you're not following the way of God. God's rules are not arbitrary. Uh, they are for our own good. And when we refuse to obey them, we suffer. We make ourselves to suffer. Yeah. Even today, people uh, are not allowed to be polygamous, at least in the United States of America. And um, I think Jesus is the, is the main standard when we come to this. And in Matthew chapter 19, he says, he who made them in the beginning made male and female. And he said to the man to uh, join his wife, yeah. not his wives. Amen. So Jesus is the authority. Well, our time is up. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. Hope to see you next time. And I'd like to know. Hi, my name is Pastor John Bridges, and I am the Plan Giving Director for Secrets Unsealed. Whether you hope to leave a lasting legacy that benefits Secrets Unsealed, provide income for a loved one, or minimize the tax burden upon your passing, bequests can help ensure your final wishes are fulfilled. Bequests are gifts that are written into your will or living trust that are distributed after your lifetime. They can take the form of cash, securities, property, or a combination of these. Gifts that are formed as a percentage of your estate ensure that your loved ones are taken care of first. Bequests are flexible, simple to include in a will or trust, and can be changed at any time please call us at 225-505-0231 and ask for Pastor John Bridges.